like first. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Sure. Okay, I think I gotta hold this guy. And remember, we have to keep this microphone closed. Good evening, everyone. Gonna use my best dramatic uh, microphone voice. Here we go. Hello, so good evening uh, to all of you here in person. We got a great turnout, and I'm just gonna already go ahead and encourage you that if you'd like to sit in the inner circle, move around, please do. Uh, and also saying hello to our friends on live stream. You'll notice that there's a couple of cameras around this evening, and so there are some folks uh, watching live. Uh, and hope that you will uh, post questions and comments uh, in the chat, and uh, we'll be looping you into the conversation throughout. All right, so. Uh, I have notes, you know, just to make sure I don't forget anything. I got things I got to cover. So thank you for joining us for our third point event, which is decolonizing in plain sight. This is the uh, third of a series of point conversations. The first one being reclaiming what's been stolen that we did inspired by uh, themes of drum folk and the Stoner Rebellion this fall. And then uh, a couple months ago, we did one on disrupting digital policing inspired by the themes of COINTELSHOW. Uh, and so with this last piece, um, decolonizing, uh, this last point, decolonizing in plain sight, we're inspired by the themes of uh, Art Emerson Productions upcoming and so we walked with wonderful Cherokee artist Delena Studi and also Nahanda with the equally wonderful artist Nora Chupamiri. Uh, but decolonizing is something that's very much on our minds at Arts Emerson, at Emerson College. So it's, uh, it's really exciting to be able to bring it together with the artistic work on stage. So, I'll, oh yeah, I should probably say who I am. Hi. Hi. So I'm uh, Ronnie Panoy. I use the she, her series, and I am the director of artistic programming here at Art Summerson. I'm also Laguna Pueblo and Cherokee. And uh, quickly before we uh, get going, I want to give a huge shout out to Kevin Becerra, wherever he is. Where are you, Kevin? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Kevin is the series producer, and these uh, series of events uh, would not happen without him. So I want to give a huge thanks to Kevin, uh, as well as all of the Arts Emerson staff, some of whom are in the house tonight, uh, for, for making sure that these events can be produced in this beautiful way that you can see. So uh, before we continue further, I'd like to open with the land acknowledgement. At Arts Emerson, we hold ourselves accountable to the work of undoing oppression and advancing equity to overcome our city's bitter history of segregation and racial inequality. As part of this work, we must start by acknowledging that we are residing on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Wampanoag, Nipmuc, and Massachusetts people whose name was appropriated by this commonwealth. We pay respect to the Wampanoag, Nipmuc, and Massachusetts elders past, present, and future, the traditional custodians of the lands on which we make and present our art. We acknowledge the truth of violence perpetuated in the name of this country and make a commitment to uncovering that truth through dialogue, partnerships, and learning. So in the spirit of tonight's event about decolonizing, I especially want to encourage all of you to read more about local land back, land back efforts, including Wampanoag Common Lands. Uh, so if you Google Wampanoag Common Lands, uh, WBUR put out a great piece on it uh, last year, and we're gonna be covering land back, back a little bit in this conversation. So with all that said, uh, one of our favorite things to say at Arts Emerson that the art uh, is the prompt and the conversation is the point. So now you might kind of see the inspiration for the series called uh, The Point. Yeah, we try to be, we try to be cute. So uh, and in terms of uh, next year's Point Conversation, this series is going to be continuing. So we hope that you join us on Wednesday, May 24th at 7 p.m. Yes, I did that. Uh, to hear about not only next year's Point Conversations, but um, all of Arts Emerson's season programming as well. Uh, two final housekeeping things before I bring in my two lovely uh, partners in crime for this evening. Uh, one is that we got concessions, and uh, we're not, we're purposely not being super formal uh, with tonight's event, so please, at any time, get up, stretch, walk around, uh, visit concessions, uh, they're here for you, and if you need the restroom, please don't stand on ceremony, go ahead and uh, head out up these stairs through the exit doors there to the left and right. Oh, okay, yeah, all right, bye. <clears throat> what a jokester. I guess we're all theater people. All right, yeah, that's what you get. 
So, uh, and then lastly, uh, there's gonna be a number of moments where uh, we're gonna wanna hear from you and your you know, and uh, your contributions to the conversation around decolonizing. So you'll notice that we aren't the only people that have mics, uh, but there are some around the space, so I encourage you to uh, release them gently and put back gently, because uh, we really want to hear from you today. All right, and one more thing, just I have to say it. So we have a celebrity in the house today, uh, the most wonderful David Dower, who some of you might know as the former artistic director of this space, is sitting just over there. <laughs> so this is incredible. <laughs> and uh, just to say, uh, David is and uh, continues to be a huge mentor for me and just has just left such an indelible mark on this space. So if you haven't met David, you should totally talk him up afterwards. And I can't sit here and not acknowledge him. So thrilled to have you here, David. That's Thank David you. Dower. Yeah. Oh, that's David Dower. <laughs> Right there. Is right that there. David Dower? That one right there. Yeah. Again, theater people. So uh, let me introduce you to these fine comedians I have uh, up with me today. Um, I'm going to keep the bios short. The bigger bios are on the website. You should check them both out. Um, they are both brilliant human beings, so I'm really honored to sit up here with. Uh, so to my immediate right, Nejem Rahim is an environmental economist. So what that means in his case is that his research involves supporting U.S. federal agencies, such as the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as they try to integrate indigenous perspectives into marine and terrestrial planning for conservation, which he'll be talking about today. Uh, he also teaches classes here at Emerson. I think there may be some students in the house and is the chair of the Marketing Communications department. Uh, he used to be a theater director in New York City and still writes plays, uh, writes and plays songs sometimes about his work. <laughs> okay, so Natty, um, for, for short, uh, Nathaniel is the full name, Justiniano, uh, is based in Boston and a queer Calorican theater artist. Uh, he is assistant professor of comedic performance at Emerson College. He is also the founding artistic director of Naked Empire Buffoon Company, which began in San Francisco in 2009 with an activist mission to devise hilarious, cutting, and visually provocative satires to catalyze urgent discourse. Ooh, what a description, I love it. Um, so much more to say, the Huffington Post has praised his work as, quote, devilishly dangerous theater, end quote, we love it. Uh, he's also an actor, community advocate, and um, yes, please read more about this phenomenal humans um, on our website. All right, so one more reminder for folks that are watching on live stream to please, uh, as frequently as you want, drop uh, your questions in the chat and we'll make sure they get up here to us. But now I think we're gonna we're gonna start uh, by diving in. <clears throat> so my job here, um, as the kind of uh, as a panelist slash moderator slash uh, you know welcome uh, welcomer for this event, is to give a little bit of context around decolonizing. So some of you may have had the pleasure of joining Nejim and me at a phenomenal event um, at as part of the teaching on sustainability, where we talked about uh, decolonization. And uh, so we've we've done one um, kind of rodeo of talking about it, and you know it's one of those things that uh, came up in our conversation as there's so much to say that there's never time and so many ways to talk about it. So this is our uh, you're getting the benefit of uh, draft two of us talking about decal today. So uh, I'm going to start with a little baseline and then invite um, Nejem and Nadi to jump in. So you might see this. Oh, go back one, please. Sorry. Uh, so this uh, lovely cartoon um, uh, is created by Annalisa Diaz and uh, Mia, Go Mia Gosling um, in partnership with uh, Maddie Syed as part of an amazing article that's on HowlRound.com and it's still one of my favorite resources in explaining what is colonization. So I'm sure all of you have seen that um, description above, but I think it's uh, an important way to start in uh, articulating the ways in which decolonization is distinct from um, other social justice enterprises like racial justice um, and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, terminologies for oppression that we use, like uh, the when we talk about the patriarchy or things like that. So decolonization um, is really uh, rooted in thinking about um, how the forces of settler colonization affect us. So in the United States and elsewhere, uh, we would uh, call this a settler colonized society. So colonization is a structure and not an event. So that may sound like a little bit of word salad, but what we mean by that is that colonization isn't just when the Mayflower showed up, 
um, but it is actually kind of the matrix and the, the, that we are, that we can choose to see or not see, or the water we swim in. So uh, just as uh, we can think about colonization being one uh, country such as uh, England colonizing another, such as what's now known as the United States or India or elsewhere in the world, um, we can also see that kind of relationship of the, um, of the colonizer to the colonized in other dynamics. So it is also reflected in the ways that we treat our planet with extractive uh, industries, the way that we treat people, how we uh, deem certain countries to be third world countries, uh, which is a very demeaning statement and kind of uh, has the same kind of structures and tensions that uh, a settler colonized society has. So, and we can go to the next slide, thank you. So there's just kind of four quick things I'm gonna try to touch on. So, you know, there's uh, tons and tons of books and dissertations and graduate level degrees in this and I'm gonna try to cover it in five. So, um, you know, send me a prayer. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, so, you know, I, I would say, you know, who in this room, um, would say that they could probably give a definition of racial justice if they were hard pressed to give one. Oh, I think you more of you can. All right, what about decolonization? Okay, oh, you know what, actually I'm impressed because I feel like usually it's like, okay, racial justice, I got it, and decol is like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, but the, the way that at least uh, for me, um, I think about the difference uh, of these two is that when we talk about racial justice, we're thinking about the fact that certain peoples um, uh, based, you could say, predominantly on the color of their uh, skin and their um, historical positioning are, uh, have had historical, um, how can I say this, there's, see I'm, I'm like trying to do it and it's kind of like hard off the top of my head. But the point is is that it's about racial disparities, right? Just, uh, historical oppression that has affected the way that different communities relate to each other now and receive different treatment in our society that is systemic and not individual one-to-one, -one, right? And it's really, the, the focus is on the racial disparity element. Decolonization is a, is a slightly different frame. Um, it's uh, still dealing with oppression, but it's really looking at the influence of a colonizing force on another group of people, typically with an extractive or, you know, I'm going to take uh, value, resources, labor from you. And those two entities can be, you know, different. It doesn't have to fall along racial lines, although it often does. So when we talk about decolonization, we're, we're really looking at undoing the, the process of colonizing, right? So great, that's easy. Um, and sure, you know, we, uh, there are places in the world that as countries have gone through this decolonizing uh, process. Uh, Nahanda um, in May is a piece that really looks at very specifically the process of how Rhodesia came to be uh, Zimbabwe but in a process of ritual and music and in a very non-intellectual way. Um, so there's a way of looking at this as a country, but for indigenous people such as myself, a lot of this has to do with a, um, uh, you could call it indigenizing, you can call it decolonizing, but it's about the relationship of uh, indigenous and enslaved people to uh, the colonial extractive forces at work. So something that's gonna keep coming up is in our um, ongoing conversation is land back. Because if colonization really had to do with extracting and taking away resources such as land, decolonization has to do with giving land resources, uh, ability to practice uh, um, ritual and sacred practice and language um, safely and um, to have all of that back that was once taken. So that's a, a very different dynamic than thinking about equity. Um, and they're, they're very related. A decolonized world it, you know, is a racially just world. We would hope a racially just world is also a decolonized world. But they're different uh, functions and relationships. And if you're curious to hear more, I would really encourage you to dig into, um, you can come and see me afterwards, uh, the HowlRound series. Uh, HowlRound is an incredible resource, uh, is our sister organization um, here, for those of you who may know. 
and they have an, a, tons of incredible free resources, an entire series on decolonizing theater and articles um, that are free, that are shareable, and a really wonderful way to dig in more because, as you'll hear, there's no one way to talk about any of this, and there are different ways to talk about it. And so uh, the thing that got me most excited about being in this room together uh, with all of you when um, Kevin and I and David House, my wonderful um, partner in crime at Arts Emerson who couldn't be here today, what got us so excited is that this decolonizing work, while it can feel like, okay, that's kind of theoretical and sure, but what does that have to do with theater and us sitting in a room together, it's, a, it's actually something that is part of transforming our world. You can do every day and in fact, the folks to my right are doing it every day, and uh, even though they're gonna be very humble and shake their heads. Uh, and decolonizing is happening in plain sight. <laughs> very humble. Uh, so there are so many places that decolonizing is happening, and uh, it's really important that we don't, um, and it's really important for indigenous peoples, I will just say, to not conflate decolonizing with being a metaphor for making things better because it's very importantly about shifting a kind of power dynamic between one entity and another, particularly at the, um, uh, at the international kind of macro levels of our society. So I think that's important to underscore. And then the last thing um, I'm gonna say is kindness and patience equals anti-racist. What do I mean by that? So, uh, I, there's a, this is something that um, I think Nejim and I especially have spent some time thinking about, which is that uh, as we're trying to change our world and make it um, a better and more just place to be, it requires some real self-evaluation and it requires some hard conversations amongst us, right? And uh, when folks let us down, when we let ourselves down, it can be very easy to go to a punitive place a place of punishment, a place of, you can call it cancellation, I don't think that that's always what cancellation is, but it is. Uh, it can be very easy to be just as uh, narrow-minded and focused and, um, how can I say this, uh, oh gosh, to generate some of the same harm as the very forces that we're wanting to undo. So the process of being patient, of giving grace, is actually going counter to the very kind of tenets of white supremacy that we're trying to undo. So uh, as we're, uh, you know, there's a beautiful image later in the cartoon that I showed of, um, uh, that uh, talks about this process of decentering as an act of decolonization. So as we kind of encourage one another to kind of step back from the center and kind of stand in a circle and uh -huh, it's almost like that inspired the setup, uh, to kind of, you know, sit as one of many rather than standing in the middle, um, that can feel like grief, that can feel like loss to someone coming from the middle and, and sitting in the circle. So, uh, you know, stages of grief is something that comes up a lot in decolonization, which you might not believe, but it's real. Uh, so I just really wanna encourage the kindness and that, uh, that kind of grace as a really important practice uh, of this work. There's no gold star in doing it, There's, it's just something that we're continually um, doing. So I think that might be a place to pause. Um, and you know, just as a way of uh, getting uh, some of the conversation going elsewhere outside of myself, um, I wanna go to Nejim and Nadi next, but before I do, I'm curious if anyone has, would like to go to a mic and give like a one sentence, you know, just a, a phrase of a place where they've experienced this, um, where they've seen or in their personal life kind of experienced colonization. Yeah, do you mind coming to the mic? Okay, hi, I'm Jason, I'm from Puerto Rico, and hey. as a Puerto Rican, <laughs> <laughs> who else? Oh, I thought there was someone else. But yeah, in my personal experience, uh, living in Puerto Rico as a current U.S. colony, I've seen colonization and its effects on its daily basis, and how when we talk about decolonization, a lot of the time, uh, the term of statehood or being becoming annexed by the U.S. is like an idea, but at the same time, a lot of people don't see it like a way to decolonize because it's just giving our land to the colonizer instead of taking it back. Yeah, right on. Um, 
there's so much to say about that, and I think it's going to naturally come up in the conversation. So thank you for raising that now. Really appreciate it. Um, do we have one more before I pass over the mic? Let's keep, let's keep your Puerto Rico in here. Um, <laughs> what about Puerto Rico? Um, I think colonization for me uh, became evident. I think the first time I really experienced it was um, my parents got divorced. My, my Both my parents are Puerto Rican, and I was looking through boxes. Uh, my dad lives in Puerto Rico now, and I remember looking through one of the boxes during the divorce 15 years ago, and I, I remember I found a wooden machete that said on it, uh, fuego, fuego, los Yankees getting fuego. Uh, which in English means fire, fire, the Yankees want fire. Um, and I, I remember asking my dad about it, and he, he basically told me a story about how going, he went to a communist rally in Vieques, uh, which is an island off the coast of Puerto Rico, uh, protesting uh, the military bases and the bombings that were testing bombings that were happening there. And I remember that was the first time I really had to be cognizant that being Puerto Rican not, did not always mean uh, being fully American, um, and I've and that that's a pretty core memory as an adult now, uh, just realizing that there is a difference, and why Puerto Ricans really stressed being Puerto Rican more than being American. Right on, thank you. Yeah, so Nejam, I'm going to pass the mic over to you. Cool. Yeah, um, and I'm not going to give much of a opening other than um, where do you decall. Um, and how has it showed up in your work, and where do you see it in plain sight and in your life and in your practice? I guess I yeah. gave you a prompt. You're welcome. Can I have a prompt? Should I use this one? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, hey, so um, where do I do it? I, my work tends to be, as you said in the beginning, more focused on a federal level, right? So um, can we actually, uh, I can't remember the sequence of all this, and it's kind of funny to have the slides behind me. Uh, could we go ahead? There we go. Awesome. Thank you. So um, that is what is called an acequia. Uh, it's an Arabic term that's made it into the Spanish language. That's in northern New Mexico in San Miguel County. So whatever. I mean, I, <laughs> it's complicated. I grew up in lots of different places in South Asia. My dad's from Sri Lanka, so I've had some of the same experiences. It's different. My dad wasn't involved. He didn't swing a machete, but like I've seen, I've seen some of those those tensions, right? Uh, myself. My mom's a white American, but. She grew up elsewhere. Um, but working in New Mexico, where I got my PhD, I got involved in looking at these ditch systems, these acequia systems. And they are, it's, it's not that acequia systems and similar kind of gravity-fed irrigation systems are used by indigenous cultures around the world. In New Mexico, these ones in particular that I worked with are more in the communities that are uh, Hispanic. So they were uh, they're Spanish settlers that came in the late 16th century, right? But they're influenced very strongly by a lot of indigenous practices, and they suffer from some of the same issues that we're talking about. So the thing that got me really interested in this, other than the individuals that I was working with, is the fact that as an economist, right, we're taught that the thing that is worth the most is the thing that is worth the most. That is the thing that people are willing to pay the most for is the most valuable to them. And that's totally upended in a context where people don't deal with money. And where buying stuff means you lose it, right? You lose it. So I started working on these ditch systems in northern New Mexico. And it's sort of slowed down a, bit, a bunch recently, but like recognizing that there's not a great legal framework in place or economic analytic framework in place for giving value to things that don't get represented in money. Now, we have methods for dealing with that, but they, they, you really have to work at it, right? And so if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so I worked on a bunch of really cool papers in this context of this work called Ecosystem Services, which is the sort of bigger frame of the, a lot of the work that I do, which is basically a way of looking at the value that humans derive from nature. Right, and so this is a lovely drawing by uh, Ernie, uh, Arnie Valdez, um, and it sort of looks at the different sections, like the cross section of what a landscape is thought of by the people who live in these acequia landscapes, right? And so most people who grow up in these communities will be able to identify parts of the landscape as not only having a particular kind of value or use, but like a historical context, right? 
And so that's a thing that's often missing in a settler perspective. Even if back home they may have had that, they come to a new place and they're just like, well, this is home. Whereas like, that's not the case. You're in a new place. The relationships are different, right? So seeing this perceptual change was super important to me and making sure that we address, like this is part of a paper that a bunch of us wrote where we took this framework of ecosystem services, which is usually represented in the given language of where you're working. In the United States, you'd think that's English, right? But the terminology that folks in this community use is Spanish. They speak English. I mean, they're, they speak English, but they use Spanish words for all of these things. So we wrote the whole paper with that vocabulary in mind, right? So that's like decentering the dominant culture in a specific way, right? It's a saying, okay, like, yeah, you could go into these communities and you could use standard sort of US geological survey English terminology for different gradients of the landscape. You talk about the Canadian life zone and so on, but like, that means nothing <laughs> to these folks. So here's how you talk to them in their language, because that's the language that they use, right? So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so you just click through a couple of these. There's gonna be a couple of things that show up on the side. And I'm sorry, I'm a professor. I have this little tendency towards kind of a slightly luxury style. Um, <laughs> but hopefully it'll clarify things. So this is how the ecosystem services framework works, right? We can think of, and it's come up, this is a very Western structure, but it's amenable to decolonization. So you think about four big categories, provisioning, supporting, regulating, and cultural. Take supporting out for the moment, just because it's a little too complicated to talk about. Provisioning is like stuff that you eat directly from the landscape, things you might cut down, right? Direct use, right? Regulating is more like you can imagine that you go out into the common and the trees provide shade. You're not cutting them down, but you're deriving a benefit from that. It's like moderating an environmental impact, right? And then cultural, is where I do a lot of my work, right? So these are things like religious ceremonies, even things like ecotourism, like non-consumptive uses of a landscape in a particular way, right? Now, <laughs> so I worked on, a, on an encyclopedia of ecosystem services and there's a bunch of contributors, uh, one of whom was a, a native Hawaiian guy named Kalani Kiocho, whose work you'll see in a few minutes. And Kalani, <laughs> he was great. Uh, but one of the things he said at a certain point, he's like, yeah, but it's all cultural. We're like, well, yeah, well, I mean, sure, I, I know what you mean, but like, but regulating is, he's like, stop, <laughs> stop. He's like, I know the framework. It's all cultural. And he's like, in Hawaii, you don't distinguish between the thing that happens in the world and your relationship to it. Your relationship to it is how you understand it, and it's where you draw everything from. And he made another point. So the way this is typically defined, it's the benefits that humans derive from nature. And again, I am, I've, I've worked in a lot of different places, so I'm never gonna speak about anything in general in these contexts, but having worked in many indigenous communities using this framework, very often a question that comes up is, what about the stuff that we do for nature? I was like, right, we don't have a concept of that. <laughs> we don't have a concept of reciprocity, right? We're just like, well, we, normally we just cut the shit down, right? or we burn it, or we kill it, or we eat it because it's good for us. So what's good about leaving it in place? That's the question, mm -hmm. right? That, and the answer to that is obvious in other contexts. It's not obvious in Western land management, right? So we try to move into the space of being like, all right, what about the reciprocity? Like, what can we do for this thing that like birthed us, right? This, this like whole phenomenon without which we would not be, right? So the cultural ecosystem services context is tricky for economists but makes perfect sense for most people. So it's kind of hilarious. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so quick quiz, because I love me a pop quiz. These are Inupiat folks hauling a bowhead whale with a big ass winch uh, up near Kivalina, Alaska, where I did some work back in 06. What, what kind of ecosystem services do we see here? Just a <laughs> quick popcorny thing. Remember there's four categories. Cultural and provisioning, right? So there's not like a bright line between these two things. You can say at least there's cultural and provisioning, right? Also, the ice is doing some regulating work, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like in many human interactions with nature, we get all of these things, right? So unbundling them, rebundling them, that's like a philosophical annoyance. But, but in this community, yeah, people hunt and kill and eat whales, and they regard whales as their teachers. 
and they have an intimate relationship with these animals going back over at least 13,000 years, right? So like the context of understanding what people are doing here is partly invisible to many people who aren't from there, right? So that's another thing. So next slide, please. So um, I'm just gonna talk through a couple of quick things. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a map of the state of Alaska and a bunch of different indigenous groups in it. So if you go up to Inupiat, it's the Northwest Arctic Borough and the North Slope, which is the farthest up there. Um, that's where I was working for this project. Next slide, please. So we're working in this little village of Kivlina where uh, a mine had proposed a big project that was gonna have this impact of affecting uh, marine mammal migration and also fish behavior and seal behavior in this area. And so, um, and I think maybe what I'll do is I'll stop with this one because otherwise it's just gonna take a long time, I realized. <laughs> I put these slides together, I was like, oh, this will be fast, and it's not gonna be fast. Um, <laughs> so when a project like this goes forward and it's funded in part by federal dollars, taxpayer dollars, right, it needs to be subject to a benefit cost analysis. So there's a formal process. And so the US Army Corps of Engineers, there's the agency responsible for, for this, did a benefit cost analysis, but the sum total of their evaluation of the impacts to the local community of Kivalina was more or less captured in how many jobs folks were gonna get for working on this project, which by the way wasn't going to happen, with just, just no evidence of that at all. And all of the impacts to their way of life, what is called a subsistence lifestyle, and particularly in the Arctic, was not counted at all. They sent people to interview some of the hunters and they put that into a, an appendix and put the appendix in the end of the report where it has no value. It's not part of the analysis. You can read it if you want, but it doesn't matter. So my friend John and I, we went up there and we did two different methods, but those, those transects you're looking at, those black lines, the solid black lines is like where people go to hunt currently. Then when we showed them what the impacts would be from this dredging project, the dotted lines are where they would have to go to hunt. So these are, we're talking about people with, I mean, an absurd amount of experience in the country here, right? And so then we just calculated the fuel cost difference between the two of those things. And we built that into the benefit cost analysis and we did another thing. So we used like totally back of the envelope economics methods to basically point out, look, the impact to this community is way out of proportion to what you're saying it's going to be. So you need to do those numbers again. Yeah. Took them to court, did it again, took them to court, did it again, stopped the project. Right, so what is that? Is that land back? It's the beginning of land back, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's some, some kind of agency over land back, right? And it's including a perspective in an analysis that was simply ignored before, All right? So the rest of this is another bunch of, bunch of super pretty slides about a couple of other projects I've worked on, but when we think about it that way, I was telling my class earlier, I was like, decolonization is not a word that I would have used before, I would hesitate to use it in my work, partly because it doesn't mean that much in my discipline. Mm. You know, people don't talk about that. People don't talk about power dynamics and economics. They do more and more now, but they didn't when I was doing my PhD. And the federal government, it's not a thing that necessarily has a meaning, except in certain sections of the world. And so, like, sometimes you have to go about it sideways, mm. right? And so, but it's about agency and it's about decentering the white narrative, recentering an indigenous narrative, and like giving agency over getting land back. Yeah, and right? what I what I love about everything you just said is that you know I think that in in um, a lot of spaces what we're talking about is okay, great, we need to talk about the stories that are not told. Sure, but in this instance, it wasn't just about okay, whose story is not being told, but how it was actually being. Um, measured, valued, and brought into the larger analysis and framework of how value was even being determined. You know, so, it, you know, I feel like uh, it's worth saying that Nejim in various contexts has had a decision about like where to put time, where to put energy, where to put focus. He heard a couple of times of taking to court. And, you know, uh, what, all of this, I think, uh, underscores the fact that land back isn't as easy as, okay, great, I have some land, I'm gonna give it to you. But it's all of these different ways that, you know, the for that we're trying to kind of uh, untether the colonizing structure from um, being the default. Uh, Natty, I'm gonna throw it over to you and bring yeah. us to some um, some beautiful artistic place and to, to Puerto Rico, to where are you decolon at? Hi, everybody. I, my uh, heart is racing. Uh, 
Um, and I'm sitting here thinking, why am I so nervous? <clears throat> and I know that a part of it is because I want to honor uh, my ancestors. And I want to do it with like smart words. Um, and I feel like my ancestors would like, that's not, you don't need to do that. <laughs> and I can hear that. So I'm trying to listen. Um, <clears throat> I think it's helpful to understand what I do as a framing, and then you'll hear uh, about how I apply it. I uh, am an actor first all my life. Um, and that's um, alighted into producing, directing, creating, and whatnot. Uh, in 2009, I started a company called Naked Empire Buffon Company with no reason for that name except a friend told me, this sounds fun. Those are really problematic words, Naked Empire Company. Um, and I like, I like living in that and trying to exp not explain it and letting people just flow with it. The, the uh, Buffon, for folks who don't know what it is, is um, a form of performance, a performance realm, a style, um, akin to like clown and comedia and tragedy and melodrama, these forms that have certain kinds of ways of doing uh, that you can sort of, sort of learn and then build new pieces that are in that form. In the late 70s, this dude named Jacques Lecoq over in Paris, France, was experimenting with this and started formally teaching it. And most practices in the world come from this guy from the late 70s. Uh, one of the teachers that was teaching at the same time named Goulier, he's still teaching, is Sacha Baron Cohen's teacher and many others, um, has a little bit of a different strain. My practice of it comes from a dude named Giovanni Fusetti. Um, who practices his own version of it, uh, coming from Lecoq. And the reason I, I'll s just note right now that I'm naming so many names is not to name drop. Um, it's a practice of recognizing I'm part of a venerable lineage, a uh, flow of knowledge and wisdom and gifts. Um, and it's, I think, important to keep naming them and bringing them to the space. So it's a, it's a, it's a practice. Uh, that Giovanni once clocked me on when I first started the company. He's like, gorgeous website, uh, gorgeous w first work, looks like you had no help. Yeah. <laughs> and I, f I was mortified, and it, he schooled me as, as, one, as, a, as a mentor should. <laughs> and so now I, I'm in the practice of naming, um, which is also associated with my practice of land acknowledgement work and uh, decolonization. So... This form, as I practice it, is satire, which is the idea of um, uh, fuck you power. Um, uh, but we're all going to laugh while we do it, because it's all relatable content, and we're all oppressed and broken in some way. So let's laugh, because it's, uh, we, it's a survival mechanism. Uh, so we make new work that laughs at and holds complicit the people in the room. People in my rooms are usually white, uh, theater-going, liberals, self-identified. And of course, uh, and so my <laughs> uh, agenda is to skewer them. That is to skewer myself uh, and see how am I complicit in my own oppression. And that, those, that's the starting question for all of our work. There are two projects we made that I think are associated with tonight's work, tonight's discussion. We made a show called You Fucking Earned It which uh, indicts uh, the imperialist project that is the United States uh, over time, uh, from the beginning of time all the way to uh, some future where Nabisco owns the equator um, and, does, and does an equator-sized park where there's no more orangutans, uh, so we have a me mechanized one that goes awry, tears everybody, tears the audience up, that's the end of the show. Good times, that's prophecy, prophecy and Buffon work. The latest work um, is a show that we created, which was an indictment, a satire of the colonial project in Puerto Rico. I'm Puerto Rican. Um, and the starting point of the show, uh, and here my heart's racing again, is 
an acknowledgement as I turn 40, I've never been to the island still. Um, uh, that there's a void, there's an emptiness in me. And I'm like, what is this? Um, pulse that ha doesn't have a call and response, but it has a call with no response in me. Uh, I s talk like a machine gun usually, I'm just trying to slow down right now. Uh, I talk like a machine gun because I'm Puerto Rican. <laughs> I have to teach my students that. I'm not mad at you. <clears throat> <laughs> this is how I love. Um, uh, when a certain quality of sun hits my face, I find myself feeling like I'm in some kind of home that I've never been to. Um, and so I'm starting to try to listen to what is, what is this? What is this? And I would encourage, like, if, if you ever, uh, everybody has lineage, everybody has roots, and a lot of that gets erased, which is part of the colonial project, yeah? So if, if there is a practice that you have, and I would encourage it to, to try to listen quite deeply to where the call is coming from uh, in your history, uh, there's grounding that happens in a real sense of peace. So that was calling, and I made a project called The Most Important Place in the World, which is a quote from um, uh, uh, Reproducing Empire as another um, book by a, by a scholar about uh, a, a aspect of the colonial project in Puerto Rico when women were tested on and used as uh, subjects to um, uh, for birth control uh, practices and, and learning how to uh, and extracting like information and uh, test subjects and human subjects in Puerto Rico so that all of the folks who use birth control in this room would uh, have that medicine, um, uh, et cetera. The project itself makes several scenes where we make fun of, it's obviously a satire, of um, ignorance in the room, uh, the desire for <laughs> uh, statehood and solving all the problems th that way, um, uh, we do indict the problematic like, the government, uh, um, both the US government and the Puerto Rican government, but also try to look what, what's underneath and what's motivating in that. It's hard to say no to money that might help, and you know, period. Um, uh, and the entire time we're trying to infuse it with a practice of, of if this is an anti-colonial play, how could the play itself and the making of it be a, decol a decolonial project. We had the room in their first go of it in a circle. Uh, we interacted quite a bit. Um, uh, we asked questions of the audience. Uh, we take them through history. We take them through a prophetic future and a hope for the future um, with a lot of questions about what it could be if we uh, removed ourselves from these uh, oppressive structures. And that was that show. So I have to say, uh, this piece that Natty is talking about was just exquisite, and I just, I still think about it. It's one of the, I think that was probably the best piece of theater I saw that year. It was, and I'm not, not hyperbolic. I mean, um, it, it is a, uh, it is such a difficult thing to thread um, the, the personal, the political, the, uh, artistic aesthetics and weave that all together into something that leaves you in a different place than when you started. And I think You're that's- You're so kind, thank you so much. N I mean, really, if, if you, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be P uh, Natty's PR tonight, so if you have um, questions, come see me. Um, but uh, no, truly, I mean, you can, um, from hearing from both Nejim and Natty, see while I, I was uh, so, by Kevin and David and I were so over the moon to have um, then be part of this conversation because you can see that it's not um, uh, it's not a neat and tidy little box. It's it's not a one road that we are traveling. Here is the clear road, and here are the steps you're going to take. And it is broader than um, the indigenous peoples of the uh, you know of my lands. It's uh, you know we don't like to think about the fact that the U.S. has uh, a, what are essentially functional functional colonies, but we do. You know, this, this also goes to notions of American exceptionalism and the stories we tell about this country. So, and, and looping it back for a second to story, you know, I, 
whereas there might be some question about like, huh, interesting, uh, in everything you're saying where, you know, the kind of artistic practice is just one piece of it. Well, I, I think decolonization is one of these things that is so threaded, not just in the content of what we put on stage, but in how we make it, how we talk about it, how we show up. And, it, and it's everywhere. So uh, I, I want to also like pull in um, more folks into this conversation too. But um, I'm, you know, I'm curious when you. I, I mean, my head is just going in so many different places. What? What I, I let me actually start here. Uh, in the group here, do you have? What is this bringing up in you? Um, hearing about uh, Nejim's work, hearing about Natty's work, any of this. Um, about your own uh, ancestral connections, about your own relationship to uh, where you find colonization practices. Would love to would love to hear any questions or reflections, and then we can keep gabbing. Yeah. Let me see if I can lift it. There we go. Hi. Uh, just a reflection. Um, the talk about Puerto Rico is just reminding me of um, my Cuban lineage. And uh, my father's side, he ca he comes from Cuba. He was a refugee. Um, when he was like four years old, he came to New York and he lived in Jackson Heights. But he was essentially kicked out by um, the Fidel Castro regime. And it he, he's become very radicalized in his political views now, um, to the point of disagreement where I don't talk with him about it anymore. But it's it's interesting to see how he's changed into this colonialist perspective where he, he prizes this perspective because he views Ameri America as his savior rather than something that has contributed to his own oppression. And he doesn't even recognize his own oppression. And it, that, that's come up in many forms in generational trauma within my family. So it's just, uh, and I didn't even realize it until this conversation actually. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, interesting. No, thank you so much for sharing that. In, in, in my dad's family, we jokingly, sorry, in my dad's family, we jokingly call that post-colonial Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> I was like, there's so many people in my dad's family who's like, well, but the English would do it like this. I'm like, yeah, that's over now, bro. You know? uh, as a devisor creator, I, uh, th this, phenomenon came up a lot when I were making the show and I had to sort of uh, think about what is the, how do I distill the dynamic, the actual f physical visual thing that is, the phenomenon that is colonization and part of w something that I'm working with right now is the idea that it needs to be extracted, something is like, pulled, so this is the pulling, and then the organizing and separating the pieces of it. Uh, which also dehumanifies if it's people. So it's not even a person, it's labor, uh, womanness, um, only straight. So the queer needs to be now, uh, we have the trash, we have the byproduct, and you have to put it away because it doesn't function for, what, for the colonizing force. So we get rid of queerness, we get rid of indigenous practice, we get rid, rid of circular decision making, we get rid of consensus, we get rid of all these things in order for, uh, because, because of the, the colonial uh, power. Uh, but over multiple generations, uh, we forget a, a little bit about the, maybe the resistance, the resistance movement or the pushback or the, the gray area of it all. And we just have peace if you do the thing. Or you're, what? Why would you do that? You're an outsider if you resist or go back. Um, and it makes zero sense for like my dad, who is a blue collar worker who just wants to smoke a joint and watch some B movies to talk about this conversation. It brings up zero joy. Um, and I, can't, I don't knock him for it. Um, and, so, and so I started to broaden my compassion for like, it's, it's, it hurts. It's, it hurts uh, to possibly reconsider why I am the way I am. And I'm really glad you brought that up because I think it connects back to um, earlier what I was trying to offer about empathy and kindness and patience because not everyone is coming into this uh, in the same way, with the same baggage, with the same 
uh, history. And, you know, the first place that I, I do feel like we often go to in these conversations is one of, oh, I can see that in me. I can see this in my family. And uh, the, the empathy of seeing it in each other and seeing it in the, in, in the conversations we have and seeing where folks have limitations and where folks are, um, and when I mean limitations, I don't mean, oh, well, they don't quite get it pat pat. I mean, literal, uh, um, I'm not gonna use the liter word literal, but um, to, to Natty's point that not everyone, uh, um, there's not a, okay, this is your responsibility and your threshold for how you have to enter this conversation if you're going to be a good ally to the de decolonizing cause. You know, this is very uh, naughty, uh, meaning like K-N-O-T-T-Y, naughty uh, work um, of trying to, to tease this out. And it's, um, it, it's in a way trying to, um, I don't know, uh, kind of try to um, pretend, uh, how can I say this? We're swimming in water and really trying to change what we're swimming in while we're still swimming in the water. You know, it's the, um, those dynamics that we're really facing in all this work. I'm going to throw a prompt to my class. Um, <laughs> hi. Uh, and even past class members. Uh, you, are, you, you hit out very well in that. That was well done. I'm very impressed. So uh, this, is, this is my extraordinary class, uh, my behavioral economics class. And tonight's readings were about implicit racial bias. And I thought, so when, when, when Ronnie asked me to join this panel, I was like, I can't, dude. I teach. And I was like, ah. Wait, hang on. What's going on? <laughs> Let me check. Okay, yes, let's do this. Right. So, uh, I think it was just kind of, kind of a lovely opportunity. I hope for a kind of field trip. Um, and so, could I throw this back to y'all? We've been talking about implicit racial bias, and we talked a little bit about how decal is distinct from, but connected to that. And I think you kind of landed on a way that it's connected to that. So, could can I ask you guys to kind of talk a little bit or bring up some questions of that connect? This read, these readings we just did on implicit racial bias and this work that we've been, that's been coming up. Can I put that on you? If the answer is no, that's okay too, but, because we're, you know, we're nice. Oh, so. not even in my class. I know, I'm not even your, I'm giving your students a little, another moment to uh, <laughs> collect themselves. Um, I actually maybe just wanted to share a little bit about sort of, I think, some of the knots that are coming up for me. Um, in this work, um, I myself identify as Asian American, um, naturalized here. Um, I was actually born in Rhodesia, so pre, you know, so pre decolonization, um, but came here because of decolonization. Um, my father was actually recruited to fight uh, for the British um, in the Civil War, mm. in recognizing that, and um, we were fortunate enough to be able to uh, seek asylum here in Boston. Um, but just thinking about, you know, as a person of Chinese ethnicity, having left, you know, my father's side of the family having left China because of the Japanese invasion mm -hmm. and coming to Africa and then through decolonization coming here into a coloni another colonized uh, country, you know, thinking about sort of like my, even just sort of my relationship um, as a person of color and sort of the working, I. For those of who don't know me, I work here at Art Summerson as a creative producer. So sort of my, my, my role in this work is the fact that we're bringing um, Delena to Boston here for And So We Walked. Um, just is bringing up a lot for me. I don't know, I think it's these waters. Like, I don't know what I'm swimming in. I don't know what my like reaction is supposed to be or my positionality of all these things, but it's, it, is, it is all very naughty and I just thought I would just share that with folks. No, thank you, Susan. And I think it's, um, yeah. Uh, the the forces of decolonization, while it's the the um, it, it's the dynamics that we want to be talking about, right? Because we we so often can go to this place of the individual and the cultural and the racial, and we don't get to the dynamics that you were just speaking about, which are so underscore your lived experience and the dynamics that have shaped your life that have brought you here. So I think that's why these kinds of conversations are so important to kind of put this layer onto our lived experience and be thinking about what are we, you know, if, if racial justice, if climate justice, if all these things are the goal, uh, are, are the goal, you know, what are the ways in which decolonization is part of and, and also a, a, a really dynamic and tricky part of the road we need to walk to, to get there? Yeah. 
Sure. And then we will get back to Nishan students. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I'm going to answer your question <laughs> from my own experience around implicit bias um, because I was going through some, some of my old stuff from when I was a kid and I'm old, so it was a long time ago. But I found a paper on Puerto Rico that I wrote when I was probably judging by the handwriting, maybe nine years old, you know, third, fourth grade. And I'm looking at this thing and, you know, it's like the uh, geography and the flora and the fauna and the people. and what I wrote, obviously prompted by what I was being taught, was that it was mostly Spanish people that lived in Puerto Rico. And it was almost like this, oh, by the way, there were these indigenous people, but they don't live there anymore. And when I looked at that, I was just like, fuck, you know, that's, that's how we learn those biases that, you know, I hope they teach better than that nowadays, but it just totally erased the indigenous culture that was there before the Spaniards came. Well, and it, it even talks about the, it puts everything in a historical context. And I think that's part of the, if anyone really wants to nerd out, you got to read some um, Tuck and Yang. Um, if you want um, a reading list, we got you <laughs> collectively. Um, but there's a, a, a something that these scholars talk about, which is like a settler move to innocence which is basically a, oh this is a this is something that happened in the past this or this is something that um, doesn't concern me for the and there's a list of I think something like 10 or 12 different ways in which um, folks who are in the you could say a settler category distance themselves from um, uh, oh gosh um, ways that they are uh, complicit and ways in which they are implicated in um, in this process I mean I myself am, from both colonizer and colonized, right? I'm um, Laguna Pueblo, I'm Cherokee, and I'm Polish. So like I have that in my own body, and I think a lot of us have that in our own bodies. And so how do we, what do we do with that? You know, um, so that's, that's real. Yeah. Nejem's class. Yeah, what was the prompt again? <laughs> that Nejem just offered y'all? I was just sort of throwing a lob Sorry, I forget about this. This is uh, tripping me out with the uh, viewers at home. Um, hi, uh, I was just lobbing this question over them. So we did some readings and just I don't know connect this to those. <laughs> however, like however, however you want, I, or, or or don't or or do something else. That's that's cool too. Joshua for gang. Um, yeah. So your part point about education like reminded me like when I was in middle school. One of, uh, in my history class, one of the teaching points for, like, colonization was Disney's Pocahontas. And yeah. it kind of is very inaccurate. It kind of, it very much, I feel like, both sides the issue, where it's <laughs> not really the case. The English came in and colonized the land. <laughs> um, and it got me thinking, like, you know, you know, and I didn't really recognize this until years later. Like, why did this happen? Why was this allowed? And you kind of think about where you're from and your like you know your demographics in your town like i came from a mostly white pretty uh conservative not like extremely conservative but a white conservative town so it's not i guess i don't feel like it's from a place of hate but it's just maybe ignorance is the correct word but there's definitely something there where it's like people aren't thinking of how this teaching can ingra be ingrained in kids and how it can be hurtful um because of maybe their own like prior educational experience. I'm, I'm not sure if that's the correct, you know, observation, but I just like looking back, I'm like, ah, that was, that was damaging, very damaging, <laughs> so. Yeah. Sir, yeah, I think because we have a, a stream, right? So you need to use the mic. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, however you wish. <laughs> no. Oh, do you want me to respond? No, were you going to No, respond? no, no, I was oh, going to okay. nod to you. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Please, please, sir. Um, I'll put this away here. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Praneet. I'm uh, originally from Nepal. Well, I, I don't know why I say originally. I'm from Nepal. Um, and uh, see, that's the decolonization. Uh, so we have our own fair share of history with uh, colonizers, especially um, since, you know, we're neighboring with India, and which was um, for a long time was colonized by um, the British, as, as we all know, we talked about a little bit. Um, but one uh, piece of small history that I would want to share is um, a place called Darjeeling. I don't know 
you guys are probably familiar with it. Um, so Darjeeling, it uh, used to be a part of um, Nepal, but then you know we had a war with the British here, so we had to give that land away. Um, and there's a long-winded history, and then uh, predominantly, the short form of the history is that a lot of the people who are settled in that region um, are primarily Nepali-speaking population. Um, and I just happened to be um, friends with, and a lot of family members who are from that region went to a school that was um, owned by people from Darjeeling, and it's uh, very connected to that place. Um, and one of the big movements that's uh, happening over there right now is called the Gorkhaland movement, um, and which I think has a lot of its roots uh, tied to land back. Um, and it just occurred to me now because um, primarily what happened was it wasn't um, a situation there uh, that was created by uh, the post-colonial, or I don't know, like after the British just left, or post-independence India, but also um, something that uh, these people have been demanding for a really long time because of their identities. Um, and right now what, hap uh, what the situation is, um, they're integrated into this state called West Bengal, which there's another history of it, but um, a simplified version is, um, is they're demanding for their own separate state. Um, and I thought about it, like, thinking about land back and this conversation, um, it, it is very surprising to me that um, even the people who, you know, like, we're, our enemies are the common, com like, I don't wanna use the term, but um, our enemies are common in some situations, just like uh, the colonial powers. But the root of it is so deeply tied into what we're doing right now, is that even millions, like miles away, thousands of miles away, that structure is still in practice. And it has become so difficult to like detach from that perspective of, okay, this was created by a colonial power. It's not as much about um, like you're taking stuff away from us, it's like giving what they deserve. And, and this is not like, that's where um, I think a little bit of the political issues come into place is the people who are putting this into practice, they're not like what you would think uh, of a typical image of a white colonial power. They're like people who look like you, who like have s shared identities as you. And I think like um, Indigo was mentioning about um, how it's this like like <laughs> post-colonial Stockholm Syndrome. Um, it's just becomes so um, confusing for even the people who are, who have the ability to change it, to like take a step back and not do it because that's a difficult thing to do and you'd just rather uh, put the things that are in place right now, but completely like disregarding the needs of the indigenous population who were there in the first place. No, thank you for that. And I think it, it so underscores the fact that this is a structure, not an event, and not a, there is no one um, person who it is easy to villainize and say, oh, they did it. You know, it's a, uh, it, it's a structure of power that we continue to see uh, that is pervasive. I mean, one of the things about the Howround article um, that I mentioned that I uh, love so much is the way in which the the structure of colonization. That there's so many examples given, even in the even in arts practice. Like, for instance, when we think about national tours, um, and the way in which there is a product that has come out of this central hub of New York and is now going around the the country as a, this is the the most the most wonderful thing that you all should be having. And you could say that the regional theater movement was you know created to to counter um, some of uh, that a bit. Um, and if you want a, a longer conversation about that, ask me to tea, um, or David Dower, but he won't be in Boston that long. Um, but, um, oh, and also to say that there is very much this notion uh, in, edu in arts education of um, teaching Shakespeare to you know, communities of color as if they need to be rescued, as if they need to be saved, they must be, you know, and it's, uh, Horrifying, I mean, it's, it's acting as if you don't have culture to begin with. It's like, that's not the challenge. Um, one of the, um, Delena uh, Studi, who will be here at the end of April, speaks really beautifully about um, uh, her experience with um, uh, well, um, Chief, 
Wilma Mankiller, who, when she came to uh, Cherokee Nation, um, she had uh, she didn't grow up on the uh, reservation for reasons outside of her control. And when she came and, and wanted to be of service to her nation and said, okay, great, what we really need is, is books and what we need is uh, all of these things to support the students. And the folks there just you know, looked at her and said, you're not, you're seeing, but you're not, uh, you're not truly, you're um, uh, missing. It's, it's very similar to what happened in what you were describing, Najem, that uh, folks were saying, you know, it's really hard to actually learn well when you haven't had a shower and there was no running water. And in her zeroing in on uh, what's going to help the education of my people, there was all these assumptions about what would be needed for students that the obvious was just completely missed. And so that it was uh, Chief Mancolor's uh, efforts that really brought running water to chair. I mean, Delena grew up without running water. You know, this amazing young uh, woman, um, I mean, she's uh, um, uh, an elder to me, but you know, this is someone who in her lifetime grew up without running water you know, on a, on a uh, indigenous reservation. So um, all of that is to say, I wanna be mindful of, um, uh, of time. I know we just have um, about five more minutes. So I wanted to open up this space for any, any final reflections, um, provocations, things to think about. Yeah. Okay, um, speaking into a mic really scares me, so. Mm -hmm. Um, my name is Ghada and I come from the Middle East and I feel like it's uh, the melting pot of colonization. And what's interesting here and what's coming up for me is um, how the topic comes and like is referred to as a very historic topic. Like it's <laughs> something that happened in the like 15 or 1600s, but there's still like colonization happening modern day, day such as like lands of Palestine. Yeah. And um, what, I, what, what is coming up to me is like the whole nuance that goes into this and how really being anti-racism and like being against colonization has to go against like a lot of the things that you hold very um, like close to your heart and like to your identity. And um, it just goes into like the system one and system two thing and how you have to be mindful and very um, intentional with, with what you stand. So thank you. No, thank you for that. And I do want to uplift the many instances of solidarity that uh, are happening. I know, Natty, I don't know if you want to say like 30 seconds on, on that. Uh, no, just that, just that in, in recent um, public conflict in both um, uh, on the island, uh, Puerto Rico, and in um, Israel-Palestine, um, that there's solidarity movements um, that, uh, serving each other. This is social media, TikTok and Instagram. Um, because of the uh, similar experiences that folks are having with trying to uh, hold on to, preserve um, uh, land and identity uh, in their history. So it, oh yeah. Just how that, what you're think, saying about the Middle East, I was just, you know, we just gone through this thing about the 20th anniversary of the American invasion of Iraq, right? And we we're talking with a lot of soul searching in this country. And I remember a thing came up, somebody was talking about, should we invade Baghdad and all these things? And they're like, well, it's a fairly cultured place. I mean, there are some symphony orchestras there. I was like, this is Baghdad. Are you joking? Like these people had like golden calligraphy when you were drinking bear fat. <laughs> Do you know, like, don't talk to me about the culture in Baghdad. Do you know what I mean? Like, like this is deep, deep, deep nonsense, right? So I was like, that's the, I think that's another thing that keeps coming up is like this quashing, like not only the New York reaching out to elsewhere, but like forgetting that like, these extraordinary riches everywhere. I mean, just freaking everywhere, right? And not looking for them, but seeking their kind of cognate in the thing that we already know artistically, right? And that's just like, I mean, okay, Shakespeare's fabulous, but like, I mean, I mean there's other stuff out there, you know? That's what I'm saying. So anyway. Back. Yep, so we could keep going. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, in the spirit of, um, we have about one minute left. Um, I wanted to actually go to, I think we might have a final slide or two. I wanna just take a second to uplift uh, some other ways you can keep in touch with us and keep the conversation going. Coming attractions from the engagement team at Arts Emerson. So we have the, um, a play reading book club for And So We Walked where we're gonna be digging into a lot of um, this conversation in more depth. Um, reading uh, the play out loud as a group. 
Um, and so that begins April 10th. Um, and so please check it out uh, and uh, you know use the QR code if you like. Um, and then if we can go to the next one. Um, I don't know, Susan, if you want to say two words on it, or I can also do the honors. Okay, great. So we have an amazing um, film coming up next week, Landfall, um, that is, uh, you know, um, I'll just say particularly focused on um, Puerto Rico um, and the, um, uh, yeah, I'm just not even going to try because I'm twisting my body and I can't do it. But um, it's it's an incredible film and it's such a uh, an incredible honor for us to be hosting it here next week. So uh, please don't miss it. Uh, so with that, I want to just take a huge, uh, uh, give a huge thanks to Nejem and Nadi for sharing this space with me. I mean, uh, basically, these are the folks that if I uh, could just take a day off and, you know, have a, a feast and just sit and talk about the, the things that are happening in our world, these are two people who I would 100% give invitations to. We could keep going for days. It's such a joy. And thank you so much for thank being here so and for sharing so much of yourself with us. And thank you all for being here. We have more point conversations happening next year. And if you want to keep in touch, um, come find me or Kevin um, afterwards. We want to hear from you and be in dialogue. So thanks, y'all. Have a great night. Thank you.